Good evening from New York. This is Wednesday, November 3rd, 734 days until the 2012 presidential election. And though a handful of yesterday's races are yet to be decided, the fate of both House and Senate is clear. Our fifth story tonight, a Republican route in the House of Representatives, a route of profound, though not unprecedented, scope, a route that failed to lap over into the U.S. Senate despite a perfect storm of opportunity. The Senate still controlled by the Democrats. This, however, is what the House of Representatives looks like as of January of next year. The red expanse, of course, distorted slightly by the fact that the Republican districts, less densely populated, take up more space on the map than their Democratic equivalents, but impressive nonetheless. Republicans now controlling a solid majority of 239 seats to 185 for the Democrats, with 11 remaining that could bolster the Republican margin even further. House Republican Leader Boehner, the presumptive next Speaker of the House, saying today that he will listen to the American people, but he already knows what they want. I mean, recognize uh, this is a time for us to roll up our sleeves and go to work uh, on the people's priorities, creating jobs, cutting spending, and reforming the way Congress does its business. It's not, what, uh, it's not just what the American people are demanding. Uh, it's what they are expecting from us. And the real question now is this. Are we going to listen to the American people? In fact, exit polls showed Americans do not want Republicans to cut spending. Only 39 percent of voters said reducing the deficit was their top priority. Fifty six percent said their top priority was either spending more to create jobs or cutting taxes, both of which increase the deficit. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, whose failure to become Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell apparently does not count in mandate math, had a similar view of the results. This election yesterday was clearly a referendum on the administration and the Democratic majority here in the Congress. Ignoring the voters and their wishes, as you could see during the entire two-year period, produces predictable results. The results were so predictable, in fact, that mathematical models based on past midterm elections and past U.S. economies pretty much dictated and predicted that the Democrats would lose 45 seats. So were those additional Democratic losses a referendum on President Obama? Not according to the voters, only 37 percent of whom called their vote an Obama protest. With government now split, Mr. McConnell suggested to the president that they meet in the middle. You will notice Mr. McConnell only identifies one side which needs to move to reach that middle. So the question is, you know, which, you know, how do we meet in the middle? And it seems to me the best strategy for the other side would be to listen to the voters yesterday. They made a clear statement about what they'd like to see done. If the president comes in our direction, obviously we want uh, to make progress for the country over the next two years. But there is, of course, a third side to this equation now. The Tea Party faction of the Republican Party, a co-founder of that Tea Party Patriots group, today outlining a similar portrait of how they are willing to compromise. We also would like to extend an olive branch as Tea Partiers all across the country. There is no hatred for President Obama. There is a deep distaste for his policies. The American people, Tea Partiers specifically, are happy to work with President Obama. It's time for him to come around to the way of the Tea Parties. The suggestion that President Obama should come around to the way of the Tea Party, stemming, of course, from the stunning success of the Tea Party yesterday. 140 candidates backed by local or national Tea Party groups ran for Congress yesterday. 45 of them won. When the handful of remaining races are tallied, as many as 95 of those Tea Partiers will have lost. And even some Republicans are saying that if Tea Partiers like Christine O'Donnell had not pulled victory from the GOP's grasp in states like Delaware and Colorado, Republicans would now control the Senate as well. Nevertheless, if Republicans think they can tell the Tea Party, uh, thanks for coming over, but I got a big meeting in the morning, the Tea Party today had a message for them, too. The American people have spoken loud and clear, and they're not in a flexible mood. They are not in a mood for compromise, and they are not in a mood to back away from their values. And we expect anybody who thinks and believes that they are speaking for the American people after last night to stand strong with and for the American people. And that's directly to Leader Boehner. The dilemma now for Mr. Presumed Speaker to be Boehner then is how to capitalize on a movement that brought money and energy to races under the radar in the House, but also brought scrutiny to the candidate's specifics in the Senate, which gets more attention. He knows full well the Tea Party will watch what happens after Tea Party House Caucus leader Michelle Bachman today said she will pursue a top leadership spot, setting up a showdown with Jeb Henserling, who just happens to be a favorite of 
GOP establishment. With us tonight to pull apart the meaning of the last night number session is Nate Silver, polling guru and contributor to the 538 blog of the New York Times. Now, good to see you, Nate. Yeah, thanks, Keith. Why was much of the Republican turnover inevitable last night, and what explains the part that was not inevitable? Well, you talked about the, <clears throat> the formulas based on the economy and the number of seats Democrats hold, where they had an awful lot of targets because they had large majorities. So you might expect them to lose 35 or 40 or 50 with an economy like this. Um, but you have to give Republicans some credit for getting up in the 60s somewhere. It might wind up being 62, 63, 64. I think they had a lot of kind of tactical success in targeting the right incumbents and targeting a lot of incumbents, mm -hmm. too, not saying we're going to pass on this district. They had a lot of money as well, both from outside groups and from kind of grassroots groups, and that helped them keep a very wide net. And at the end, Democrats had to kind of cast aside, say, we're giving up on, on 15 or 20 of these you know, uh, incumbents, and th those guys lost, and so did you know, 40 others. What did uh, America say, according to the, the, the analysis of this? Did they say less spending, lower deficit? I think they said not Democrat. Yeah. <laughs> Most, I think they said, look, you know, we perceive the economy as still being poor and as not having been fixed in spite of spending lots and lots of money to try to do so, you know. But Democrats actually had a slightly better favorability rating, which was still very bad among the exit polls last night than Republicans did. So it was more a not Democrat election than a yes Republican election. How much of last night was about who voted? Was it all uh, young people and mama grizzlies? Well, you know, you always have some, some kind of runoff from the presidential years for Democrats in midterms, except in 2006, which was an exceptional year mm -hmm. in many ways. You don't have as many minorities vote. You don't have as many young people vote in midterms. Um, but it was pretty across the board from what we can tell, which to me indicates that it was mostly about the economy and kind of the direction of government and so forth, and not about a lot of little issues like it, you might have in a year where the country's been through less kind of pain, I think. Everyone is harmed by the economy, the, the, you know, the wealthy and the poor and women and men, and so kind of all groups move by roughly the same amount against mm -hmm. Democrats. Did the, any of the models suggest that the, that the Republicans should have taken the Senate under these circumstances as well? Well, you know, we had them with about a 10 percent chance of winning the Senate. It looked, though, once they lost that, uh, or once Christine O'Donnell won, rather, in Delaware, it became a lot harder, you know. And also, they, you know, they probably should have won a race in Nevada where you have the majority leader of the United States Senate uh, who has a 40 percent approval rating in the, on a night when his party lost right. 65 seats in the House. He should probably lose his seat. And they ran a really good campaign, but, you know, Sharon Angle was not the most appropriate GOP nominee. This, the, thus, the split between the House and the Senate, is it expl explained by uh, radicalism generating energy on these sort of low scrutiny races at the, at the House level, but you have higher scrutiny races that sort of buck up against all that energy in the Senate races? Yeah, I think in part, I mean, you know, if you have like the generic Democrat running against the generic Republican, you know, this year the generic Republican was going to win in most districts, you know, but when Harry Reid made it about Sharon Angle and not about the party mm -hmm. labels or in Colorado, you know, which has been called for Michael Bennett, you had something similar. It's a different story. But in House races, people don't know the candidates as well. They just kind of look at the party labels. Most of the platforms are pretty standard. And so, you know, when the personalities were less involved, Republicans did very well. And Democrats are fortunate in some ways, you know, not to have lost the, the Senate. Uh, I know you sleep periodically. Have you done anything about 2012? Have any of your models been adjusted because of 2012? Any well, there, or any? There are, there are trading markets where you can look at the chance that Obama will be reelected, and they didn't move either way last night, really? not a pinch, right, where he's still at about 58 or 60 percent, which seems about reasonable mm -hmm. to me. And the thought is, hey, you look what happened to Reagan and Clinton, you know, and they both lost pretty badly at the midterms and kind of recovered. You know, the fact that he has a Senate means that they have something to build on in the kind of post-2012 world because they're you know the senators elected tonight will last through the end of obama's second term right. if there were to be one you know so the fact that you know they can reverse all the losses in the house um and the senate they're not so badly beaten up that they couldn't recover and have some kind of working majority in 2012 or 2014. as our old friend nick bakai said uh the numbers never lie nate <laughs> silver from uh, the new york times blog 538 always a pleasure sir thanks for coming of course thanks keith